Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by, and welcome to the Bank OCK Fourth Quarter 2019 Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participant lines are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star, then 1 on your telephone keypad. Please be advised that today's conference may be recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star, then 0 to reach an operator. I'd now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Mr. Tim Hicks, Chief Administrative Officer. Please go ahead, sir. Good morning. I'm Tim Hicks, Chief Administrative Officer and Executive Director of Investor Relations for Bank OZK. Thank you for joining our call this morning and participating in our question and answer session. In today's Q&A discussion, we may make forward-looking statements about our expectations, estimates, and outlook for the future. Please refer to our earnings release, management comments, and other public filings for more information on the various factors and risks that may cause actual results or outcomes to vary from those projected in or implied by such forward-looking statements. Joining me on the call to take your questions are George Gleason, Chairman and CEO, and Greg McKinney, Chief Financial Officer. We will now open up the lines for your questions. Let me ask our operator, Liz to remind our listeners how to queue in for questions. As a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, to ask a question, you will need to press star, then 1 on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Again, that is star, then 1, if you'd like to ask a question at this time. Our first question comes from the line of Ken Zerby with Morgan Stanley. Your line is now open. Great. Thanks. Good morning. Um, I guess maybe we can start off in terms of that substandard credit uh, that was formerly watch list. Do you just help us size the potential losses on that um, and also the timing of any potential resolution around that? Thanks. Uh, good question, Ken. Thank you. Uh, you know, we do not have any uh, thoughts on what a loss might be. Obviously, uh, the loan is still uh, performing as an accruing loan. The uh, fact that it's a performing accruing loan is a result of our analysis that, you know, you know projects our future uh, uh, cash flows, interest, principal payments, and so forth on the loan. And um, uh, while the margins are very thin, uh, we currently project that there will be enough cash flow from the project to uh, uh, repay all of the principal and all of the interest on our loan. And, of course, we're projecting interest into the future on that using a forward yield curve as a, as a proxy for what interest rates will be in the future. So based on that, there is no uh, present loss in it. Now, if you look at the appraised value in, in our bubble chart uh, in our management comments, it is more than 100% loan to value, but obviously the appraisal uses a higher discount rate than the effective rate on our loan. So if you use the effective rate on our loan in a forward yield curve, there is no present loss exposure. What would cause there to be loss exposure and would cause this credit to move from substandard accruing to a non-accrual uh, status uh, would be a a change in sales prices, projected sales velocity, interest rates that in some combination of those uh, cause that uh, forward uh, projection of net present value to become negative instead of uh, a positive differential uh, over the loan amount. So, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly since there's no present evidence that the loan is impaired, uh, it's premature to talk about what the uh, loss would be. The uh, timing for resolution, your other question, uh, you know, I think this loan will be with us quite a while. Uh, the uh, sponsors are working the project very effectively, and while their fourth quarter sales and signing of sales contracts were a little bit below uh, what we would have hoped for, which caused the uh, uh, or contributed to the downgrade. Uh, the uh, uh, reality is they're still selling townhomes and selling lots. They're still starting new townhomes and uh, working toward development of a, an additional small phase of lots. So I, I think the uh, 
expectation we have is it's going to be a long-term deal, and uh, they're going to continue to work it, hopefully successfully, and uh, hopefully their sales prices and sales velocities will be stable to improving, and that will lead uh, the uh, profile of this credit to improve uh, if their sales Velocity and sales prices decline. That will lead the uh, lead the profile of this credit to decline. So that's about all I can say about it. Gotcha. But I guess I guess in the release you talked about you know sort of the the reason why it was downgraded was because projects were being delayed or canceled, which I guess I kind of think about as being synonymous with sort of a deterioration in the sort of the cash flow outlook. I mean, is that the right way of interpreting it? That that there was a deterioration in this credit, which led it to be downgraded, or it was downgraded for some other reason. No, you're you're exactly right. Uh, we had several, uh, or they had the sponsor had several contracts fall out. Uh, uh, some of those were for lots, some for townhomes, and and they were either fell out or delayed uh, in in closing, and um, that resulted in several million dollars less in sales in uh, Q4 than we. Uh, had previously expected, and we mentioned in our management comments that the uh, uh, sales volume of lots under contract that you know would have near term closings was was very low. I think there was one at the end of the year, and I think they've signed up one since the end of the year on the lot side. The townhome sales are are uh, uh, better than the lot sales, so that. Having a few contracts fall out in Q4 lowered the uh, receipt of cash there, and uh, you know pushed out the time frame for the uh, development sales, and and uh, uh, the margins got thinner. Uh, the margin for error got thinner as a result of that elongation of uh, uh, the sellout uh, expectations. So you're exactly right; it's a cash flow issue. Got it. Okay. And then maybe switching gears just a little bit. In terms of uh, the RSG portfolio, so I, I noticed that you did say that both payoffs and origination should be a little bit higher in 2020. Um, it seems that net-net you should still have positive growth in RSG, but just kind of want to get a sense, like, is it is it possible that these balances could be either relatively flat or even down for the, on the, on sort of on a, on a point-to-point basis in 2020, given payoffs? Hey, Ken, this is Tim. I'm, I think I, I'll point you to figure eight on our uh, uh, management comments, which is on page nine. Um, you know, there we, we show the trends of, um, uh, of our originations by year and the, and the trends of the uh, remaining loans outstanding by year. So you can see in 2016 originations, we had $8 billion uh, of loans originated in 2016. 2.08 billion are still outstanding. And then you can see in 2017, we had $9.1 billion of originations, uh, where at the end of the year, we had $6.06 billion of, uh, of those balances uh, remaining. Uh, those, you know, as we've talked about before, our, our construction loans uh, typically average about three years in, in life, somewhere two to four years is, is the span typically, where the average is around, uh, around three years. So if you look at our 2017 origination volume, uh, you know, most of those loans are come, uh, will come to completion uh, this year. Uh, and as we've seen in, in many of our RESG loans, is, is once the project is complete, uh, we get paid off pretty soon after completion. So it's just a cycle of, uh, uh, um, of uh, origination volume that we had from three years ago coming through. Um, but the, the uh, total funded balance will, will move up. Um, you know, we may have a quarter um, or two uh, throughout the year where it's, it's like it was in, in Q4, which w- it was down in Q4, uh, and there will be quarters where it's up. Um, uh, but, um, you know, I think uh, our good origination volume that we saw in 2019 and our expected uh, good origination volume that we're expecting in 2020 should should help uh, uh, alleviate some of those payoffs that, that are coming from our uh, previous origination years. Got it. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. 
Our next question comes from Stephen Scouten with Piper Sandler. Your line is now open. Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Stephen. Um, so appreciate, obviously, all the detail you guys give, and figure eight is kind of where I wanted to focus as well. It, it's kind of I'm thinking about the forward growth, and I, and I get why pay downs would be higher with the 16 and 17 originations, but it seems like those pay downs would start to abate in the back half of 2020 as we move further through that pipeline. Is that at all possible, and do you think there's some likelihood you could see growth in RESG pickup in the back half of 2020 or 2021, or, or is that just too early to say? Uh, Stephen, I would, I would add a little additional color, and again, I think Tim uh, took uh, – the last question to the right figure, which is figure eight. You know, the majority of probably the remaining originations from 2016, uh, a large percentage of that will pay off a, a big chunk, although we wouldn't expect near all of the 2017 originations to uh, pay off in, in 2020. And then we'll have a, a little bit of the 18 originations that have paid off. Uh, one of those loans has already paid off. So. Um, you know, you'll see uh, you you uh, you will see a high level of payoffs. We expect in 2020, and uh, those results will be fairly variable from quarter to quarter. If you look at the uh, first quarter of this year, I think RESG had net funded growth of about, if I'm right, 442 million. But it shrunk in Q2, 228 million. It had funding growth in Q3 of 256 million, but shrunk in Q4 of roughly 157 million. So we had two quarters of uh, uh, positive growth, two quarters of negative growth uh, for the year. RESG's funded balance grew about 314 million dollars. You know, it's. Uh, uh, to kind of go back on Ken's question, it it is uh, you could you could paint a scenario where we would have negative RESG growth for the year. We don't think that's necessarily uh, the likely scenario. You could also paint scenarios where we had uh, better growth in RESG in 2020 than we did in 2019. But uh, you know, uh, I, I think the uh, uh, kind of center line of that growth is probably somewhere plus or minus not terribly far from what we saw in uh, 2019 because, again, we're going to have a big wave of payoffs, and we should have better originations in 2020, but we're also expecting bigger payoffs, so it, it probably is pretty much offsetting. Okay, very helpful, color. And then on, on the NIM commentary, I guess from page 15, I was a little bit surprised um, to see that it, it sounds like even in a unchanged rate environment that you'd see um, additional downside to the NIM, just maybe not the same magnitude. So can, can you help me with that, and are you guys given any kind of numerical guidance around what you think the magnitude of the incremental compression could be even in a flat rate environment? You want to take that, Tim? Yeah, hey, Stephen. Um, uh, we gave you some uh, comments around our uh, uh, expected increase in deposit costs. Um, you know, uh, on on our commentary, you had referenced page 15, which is a good uh, good reference as well. On page 17, um, we we talked about our cost of interest bearing deposits. You know, it was down 12 basis points uh, in Q4, which followed a six basis point decline in in Q3. Uh, we did indicate that we didn't think Q1 decline would be as great as the Q4 decline, um, but we do expect it uh, to decline in, in Q1. Um, so that uh, on the deposit funding side, that will that will help. Um, you know, we'll we'll continue to work on um, our deposit mix and hopefully uh, continue to improve our deposit costs as we go throughout the throughout the year. Um, on the loan side, uh, uh, obviously, if the Fed uh, uh, doesn't move rates in 2020 and LIBOR stays fairly stable, uh, the impact um, that we would be dealing with on the on the loan yield side would come from competitive factors. And obviously, we're in a very competitive environment for loans right now. So, the competitive factors for loans, and then a slight uh, you know change in mix. Obviously, our RESG loan yields are are higher than the average, and our community banking and indirect lending or loan yields are 
or uh, or below the average. Um, so, you know, I think that's what we're dealing with on the loan yield side, um, but um, um, you know, mostly on from competitive factors uh, from from that perspective. Okay, helpful. And then one last clarifier for me. You know, the, this substandard obviously you gave good color. That feels pretty well contained. I'm wondering if you could give any insights into any new credit migration, if there is any, like where you guys list, you know, the moderate bucket maybe in your 10Q. Can, can you give us any visibility into to any early stage migrations that may or may not be occurring? Uh, I'm not aware, uh, Steve, I'm not aware of any other than our watch credit category went down by a comparable amount that our substandard category went up. So, um, um, you know, that that will show a positive migration and what uh, I mean a decline in that balance. Uh, I'm not sure of any any major changes between uh, our other categories, moderate um, category or, uh, or any of our other categories. Okay, perfect, very helpful. Thanks for the time, guys. Our next question comes from the line of Daniel Mannix with Raymond James. Your line is now open. Yeah, hey guys, good morning. Good morning. Um, I want to dig a little deeper into loan dynamics, specifically on originations. Uh, has, have you seen any change in the approval rate on your loan pipeline recently? I think it's been about 5% in the past. So just, just trying to get a better sense on whether or not you know, you're passing on more loans due to competition or maybe some other factors. Uh, Daniel, I don't. We don't track that the same way we used to in regard to uh, uh, flow coming in. So I can't really a address that percentage number. Um, you know, I would tell you we are, as Tim alluded to earlier, in a very competitive environment, uh, and that seems to be true for all types of loans: uh, RESG loans, indirect loans, community banking loans of various types. It's just. Uh, it's an environment out there where um, uh, volume is uh, desired by a lot of lenders. We're seeing a lot of lenders get very aggressive on credit and very aggressive on, on rate to get that volume. As we have commented repeatedly and consistently, you know, we're non-negotiable on our credit standards. We'll give a certain degree on rate, but not beyond a point. Uh, so our giving somewhat on right uh, has, has contributed to uh, uh, declining loan yields. Uh, our not giving it all on credit, not giving beyond a certain point on right has contributed to our declining loan volume. We continue to believe that that discipline is definitely the right approach. We're not going to waver from that discipline. And uh, we think we'll get rewarded for that when uh, economic conditions reach a point where guys who are being too aggressive uh, get punished for it. We think we'll be in a great position to uh, uh, shine and, and grow in a meaningful way at that point in time. Got it. Thanks, George. So in terms of loan demand, uh, you, you got it to slightly stronger originations in 2020, um, but still off from peak levels from a few years ago. Can you tell us what's driving that? Is it um, increased loan demand in major metros, or is this a case of uh, gaining share of a smaller pie, if you will? Um, you know, I would tell you that we're seeing less um, uh, origination volume in certain markets where you've got uh, an adequate amount of supply. New York would be the uh, um, uh, poster child for that, probably. Uh, the New York market is just there's a need for less new product there because there's been a lot of product built and uh, uh, tax and other issues there have, have, you know, diminished the need for a lot of new product. Uh, we continue to originate some new volume in New York, but our, our total commitments in New York at the end of the quarter just ended were the lowest that they've been since the uh, uh, first quarter of 2018, so uh, lowest in eight quarters. And I would expect that uh, our, our total commitments 
funded and unfunded to New York will continue to decline, not because we wouldn't originate good new loans there, we will, but our payoffs there will exceed originations. So in the, uh, in the uh, quarter just ended, you know, we originated uh, loans in uh, a lot of uh, markets, uh, Boston, uh, D.C. area, you know, and uh, more uh, markets such as uh, uh, Dallas was, uh, I think, our second largest volume of originations in the quarter just ended, uh, Boston was the largest. Chicago uh, was third. San Francisco was fourth. Atlanta was fifth. Um, you know, you, you get down and you've got Sacramento, Phoenix, Savannah, Philadelphia in the top ten. And, and markets that we got a lot of volume in in the 16, 17 time frame, Miami and New York are, you know, farther farther down the list. So, You've got to go to the markets where the supply-demand metrics make sense and their projects that uh, are getting done that uh, make sense. So that is, uh, in, in a lot of cases, more uh, uh, secondary markets or at least not your, you know, your traditional kind of top five markets uh, in some cases. So we're, we're finding the volume. My, my compliments to our loan team for the uh, what I think is incredible work that they uh, did in 2019, originating uh, you know 6.48 billion dollars of loan originations in uh, RESG, uh, up uh, you know about a billion and uh, three quarters from the prior year, and uh, still holding very steadfast to our discipline and pricing standards. And to accomplish that, they had to, uh, they had to burn a lot of shoe leather and make a lot of calls and uh, really study and explore and understand a lot of markets uh, that uh, we got some volume out of that was very helpful to us, high quality, good yielding volume. So it's a, uh, it's a, you know, it's a good outcome when you look at the results that our teams achieved and the context of the competitive uh, environment in which we're operating and the fact that some of the major markets where we've in recent years gotten a lot of volume just didn't have as, as much new development that created new demand. Great color. Thanks, George. That's it for me, gentlemen. Thank you. Our next question comes from Katherine Mueller with KBW. Your line is now open. Thanks. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Um, I want to see if we could circle back to loan yield. And can you provide us um, just generally where current loan yields are in the community banking segment and then in the indirect uh, RV and marine it's as we kind of think about how that mix, even if, if we're in a flat rate environment, how just that mix change may impact um, loan yields this year? Well, you know, in the community banking environment, we've got so many different uh, verticals there uh, in community banking, so many different types of loans and specialty types of loans we do. Those yields tend to uh, be all over the board depending on that, uh, that, that type of loan. Uh, I would comment in the indirect area that uh, you guys noted, I'm sure, that our, our volume of growth in indirect uh, was uh, was probably the lowest in the uh, quarter just ended that has probably been in a number of quarters. And uh, that reflects the fact that uh, uh, that market has gotten very competitive. You know, if you follow the uh, marine and RV manufacturers at all, uh, you'll, you'll get the uh, impression that a lot of those manufacturers are shipping less product because there's less product being sold at retail. So, so the fact that there's uh, less consumer paper being originated on fewer marine and RV sales than there were a year ago uh, is, is resulting in less paper for uh, lenders to the retail customers such as us and, and a host of competitors. 
and some of our competitors have gotten pretty uh, pretty aggressive on both credit and rate. And uh, once again, we're having to be very disciplined on the credit to make sure we get what we want. And uh, we're having to give a little ground on rate to uh, stay in the game. So uh, that is an area where competition uh, has hurt our our margins bad. And, and is it fair to assume that um, the indirect RV and marine growth will kind of remain around the level you saw this quarter? And, and if so, is community banking momentum enough to offset that so those two pieces are kind of offsetting? Um, that, that's a really good question, uh, Catherine, and it, it's uh, number one, we, we do expect uh, our community banking uh, units to uh, uh, be a, a bit of strength to us in origination volume. Those guys seem to be gaining traction, and uh, it's, it's been slow uh, elevation of, of their uh, production, but they seem to be continuing that trend. Uh, the indirect marine and RV space is very competitive. Now, one thing that we are doing is, uh, you know, we have, in conjunction with uh, CECL implementation, uh, which, of course, occurred on uh, January 1 of this year, uh, we have built out uh, a series of scorecards over the last couple of years for all of our different loan types. And, um, you know, where we used to have a dozen or fewer risk ratings for loans. We now have 72 risk ratings for loans, and uh, uh, all that w is being implemented in connection with CECL. So it, it lets us uh, grade and uh, uh, refine our credit assessments of loans much more precisely than we have with our, our models and tools in the past. Uh, in, a, in addition to that, we've been building up uh, large um, pools of data that we're using in those uh, loan risk ratings and grading uh, assessments. And uh, we're beginning to use a lot of that enhanced data that we've built over the last couple of years and particularly the last year into uh, our credit analysis in our uh, indirect lending, and I, I think that uh, as well as other other categories of lending, but um, I, I think that uh, part of our uh, growth equation for indirect lending for 2020 will depend on how effective we are in utilizing our enhanced data and modeling and analytics capabilities in that area, which we we had a lot of data already, and we used a lot of analytics there uh, previously, but we've refined and enhanced all that. And I think our ability to uh, uh, grow that unit uh, equal to or slightly more or slightly less than last year will depend on a combination of, one, competitive conditions, and, two, our ability to use these uh, enhanced tools to uh, be a little more surgical and precise in our pricing and uh, approval of credit. So we're, we're doing things uh, uh, that we think will help us continue to keep the volume up without sacrificing uh, quality at all and without sacrificing our uh, yield on those loans uh, very much at all. Great. And you mentioned Cecil. If I could just ask one more on Cecil. Is, is there any um, thoughts that you can give us on how you're thinking about what the potential impact could be to the provision this year? I mean, I appreciate it'll, it'll be volatile, and you mentioned that in your prepared remarks, but anything that we should be thinking about as we model the provision in a post-Cecil world? Well, of course, uh, since you're reserving for life of loans and, and for commitments, uh, which you've previously not uh, provided for in the past in the form of commitments. Uh, when you have large origination quarters, you'll have a disproportionate uh, hit to income from CECL. So uh, we'll all be saying, hooray, we, uh, we originated a lot of loans in this quarter, and, and we'll be crying uh, about the fact that it, it 
harmed earnings because you put up a big provision and then in quarters where you have uh, low originations uh, you'll you know you'll have the opposite impact so uh, yes uh, provision expenses will be up with Cecil because you'll be providing for unfunded commitments and to the extent those grow that will require more provision and you'll be providing for life of uh, loan estimated losses, not just incurred losses, as uh, existed in uh, 2019 and before. Great. All right. Great. Thank you for all the color. Our next question comes from the line of Timur Brazeler with Wells Fargo Securities. Your line is now open. Hi. Good morning. Thank you. If we can circle back to the substandard loan, can you provide an update on the uh, outstanding balance and what the current reserve level is? Yeah, Tamir, this is Tim. Um, on the outstanding balance, I, uh, the total commitment is $57.5 million. At year end, I think it was pretty close to that. I mean, with it, within each quarter, it goes up and down. Um, but uh, at some quarter ends, it's been, uh, you know, 50 or 52, but throughout the quarter, it will go up and down, and it, it's fairly close to that $57.5 million at year end. Um, with the migration from watch uh, status uh, to substandard accrual status, it does have a 5% uh, reserve associated with that, which is greater than the 2.5% we had um, allocated to it under, under the watch rating. Okay, thank you. And then maybe just circling back to some of George's recent commentary in the indirect portfolio, can you provide an example of what some of the competition is doing and, and being aggressive on the structuring of these credits? You know, I'm, I'm always reluctant to uh, talk about our competitors, but again, we, we've seen uh, 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 some competitors get uh, very aggressive on price which has is, is forced us to uh, adjust our pricing uh, to a degree. Um, and we've seen um, some competitors get, uh, you know, very aggressive on, on credit, which we've not responded to at, at all. And, um, you know, typically uh, in, in the business, your, your uh, credit is really driven by your credit, you know, of your your borrower combined with how much you're you're willing to uh, to uh, loan against that, and uh, I think in recent quarters our average weighted average uh, loan has been somewhere from about 99 to 104 percent of dealer wholesale invoice price, uh, which means our customers, our borrowers, the consumers have a a fair amount of uh, down payment, either from cash or trade-in or some combination of those in the transaction that provides us, you know, some protection and assurance of their commitment to the, uh, to the credit. Uh, we've seen uh, some of our competitors being much more aggressive in that regard and uh, allowing a lot of back-end and soft costs to be financed in uh, in the uh, in the loan, so you know there there are wide differences in uh, how you approach credit quality in that space, and and we've always been on the very conservative uh, end of the uh, spectrum there. Okay, uh, maybe switching gears, the cash position continues to grow a billion and a half here at year end. It sounds like loan growth is going to be a little bit slower in 2020 than 2019. How should we think about the cash position? Um, is there any willingness to, to park some of that in the securities portfolio, or is the shape of the yield curve still prohibitive in that front? Well, it's, there's there's not a, a lot in the uh, securities world that uh, is uh, is very exciting right now. I, I uh, apologize to our shareholders uh, that earlier in the year, late last year, I failed to recognize that the tenure at 194 was a screaming buy. Uh, <laughs> that wasn't immediately obvious to me. But you know, it's just it's hard to get uh, excited 
about uh, much in the securities world, and uh, uh, we have had a big focus over the last year of uh, increasing liquidity as measured by various uh, ratios and uh, keeping more cash on balance sheet. Um, that cash position will vary from uh, uh, quarter to quarter, but um, I think in general uh, we would expect you know, over the next four quarters to see our liquidity ratios continue to improve and our cash position be be uh, strong, stronger in some quarter ends than others, but but generally strong. Uh, you know, our uh, philosophy has been to uh, uh, grow capital and uh, increase liquidity and uh, get ourselves in a position to uh, take advantage of opportunities uh, caused by economic turbulence, dislocations, or whatever, when and if those uh, situations arise. So I think we're continuing to uh, pursue that philosophy. Okay, and one last one for me, just speaking of capital, well, the TC here north of 15%. I guess what's the main prohibiting factor from starting or at least announcing a buyback? Are, are you are you waiting to see the, the impact of Cecil? Is there... Is something else coming down the pike that we, we might not be unaware of here? I guess just what's the internal conversation as to why not at least announce a, a buyback here? Well, I think we've given um, uh, patent estimates on CECL, and uh, those are included in our management comments. And obviously, uh, um, you know, there is extra provision and extra reserve cost associated with CECL, but those are – very manageable uh, cost and, and probably not outside of anybody's uh, expectations for a bank of our size with our level of unfunded uh, commitments. And those, uh, our, our estimated uh, day one impact of Cecil actually came down from the uh, earlier guidance we'd given a, a quarter ago. So uh, that's not an issue, and uh, there are no uh, – things that I think to use your uh, uh, term or paraphrase your term that we're aware of that would cause us to uh, hold more capital. It simply uh, reflects the fact that we believe in the long-term ability of our company to grow organically and, and uh, at the right time through acquisitions. Uh, we believe that that capital will be uh, very useful and important to us in achieving those longer-term objectives. And uh, uh, we've, for those reasons, because we believe in our business model, uh, elected to not uh, pursue a share repurchase uh, up to this point. Uh, that will be something that our board will continue to monitor, uh, but we've not pursued it up to this point. Understood. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Aaron Saganovich with City. Your line is now open. Thanks. Um, with the, the top line growth somewhat challenged, it sounds like, in 2020, uh, you still have operating expenses guided to the high single digits. Are, are there any levers that you can pull from your expense side to you know, better match the, the top line growth that you have for 2020 and maybe even forward as well? Uh, Aaron, there there are a lot of levers that we could pull, uh, but um, um, our our focus is on uh, really improving our company and preparing for the future. Uh, so you know we could do what uh, a lot of banks have done and and will do in these situations in the past, and that's lay off a lot of people and cut costs and and just hunker down. Um, we are very forward thinking and um, uh, we really believe uh, intensely in the future prospect and, and uh, uh, power of our, our business model and the various business units we've built. So we are continuing to uh, invest significant sums. We're trying to do it as as prudently as we can, but we're continuing to invest significant sums to uh, build our human infrastructure, our technology, our, our risk systems, and all of the other systems, controls, and things that, 
that you need to uh, grow and be a larger bank than we are today and to really deploy and, and uh, optimize uh, our experience for our customers as well as our results for our shareholders. Now, we could be very short-term oriented and say, wow, you know, I'm, I'm hyper-focused on driving every penny of the EPS I can in 2020, and I'm going to cut a bunch of costs, and I'm going to be very stingy in, in paying our people, even the high performers, and risk losing some of those people and whatever. Or you can take the approach that we're taking, and we believe that uh, when we get past this wave of payoffs and, and get a lot of this infrastructure bill really finalized in 2020, that we'll be in a very strong position to uh, grow and advance our company in 2021 and 2022 and 2023, and we can spend some money investing uh, now so that we've got the people and the processes and the customer relationship and all the things that we need to uh, do to grow in, uh, in those years and, and do it in a very meaningful and favorable way for shareholders. Uh, we feel like we're very much in a short-term versus long-term decision uh, mode here. And, uh, you know, I certainly want our 2020 results to be good, uh, but frankly I'm much more concerned about building the infrastructure and improving our company so that in 21 and 22 and 23 we can do great, uh, great things. Uh, so that, that's the uh, focus. You know, in, in 2019, I visited every office in our company and spent 45 minutes to three and a half hours with every team in our company. And uh, I asked two questions repeatedly in every meeting, and uh, those questions were, what can we do to improve the experience for our customers every day, every way, and what can we do to improve uh, our efficiency and and your work environment and make you more efficient, more productive, and, and as an employee of our company, have a more enjoyable uh, work experience because if our staff is uh, feeling good about our company and highly motivated, that comes across to our customers, and in fact comes across to our customers, we have more success growing our business and uh, uh, expanding and building the kind of profitable relationships with customers that we want to have. So, you know, we got literally hundreds and hundreds, uh, I think over 1,100 recommendations for improvement for our staff that we uh, have elected to adopt. We've already implemented uh, somewhere close to seven or 800 of those improvements over the course of this year. We spent some money doing that, and We'll continue to spend some money doing that in the next year, but we think in the uh, world of banking, uh, where there are going to be fewer banks every year, that the banks that are going to be successful five years, 10 years, and 15 years from now, and, and they're not going to be nearly as many of them, we think that those banks are going to be banks that build exceptional experiences for their customers, and we're working really hard on doing that. So. We're spending money on that and a lot of other infrastructure development. I could pull back on that and uh, improve EPS a, a penny or two a quarter, but uh, I think that would be silly and, and foolish because I think the long-term potential of what we can achieve if we really take advantage of this uh, slower growth period in which we find ourselves right now to really fundamentally enhance and build and improve the capabilities of our company in a, in a significant way, I think we get paid back for that massively in future years. So uh, I'll, I'll ask our shareholders to be a little bit patient and think long-term as opposed to short-term. And uh, I think if we do that, we, uh, we get a good reward out there for that patience. Thank you. Very helpful. Our next question comes from Matt Olney with Stevens. Your line is now open. Hey, thanks. Good morning, guys. Hey, good morning, Matt. 
George, I wanted to stick with this uh, discussion on expenses, and, and I appreciate the long-term focus for shareholders and not looking for shortcuts with, with layoffs. And it also sounds like you're, you're working on ways to become more efficient in the future. But I think we previously thought that the larger infrastructure build-out was going to wind down and, and slow the first part of 2020. And now with the new guidance, it seems like that infrastructure build-out will continue throughout the year. So I guess the question is that we're wondering is, What's changed over the last few months? Well, Matt, I tell you, you know, we talked about, um, you know, early in uh, last year that, that I was really hopeful that we could uh, uh, get a lot of these consulting costs that we were paying out of the company and, and uh, that we were building a lot of staff members in-house to, uh, to do a lot of that work, and uh, that would allow us to get rid of the uh, consultants. Um, you know, with this loan scorecard, risk rating project, CECL, uh, a lot of the data building initiatives that we have uh, pursued to really accumulate, manage, and, and uh, uh, get a lot more control over data and some further enhancements that we've made to uh, credit risk and analytics and modeling capabilities and uh, uh, internal audit and so forth. You know, we we've continued to uh, uh, spend a little more money, probably every quarter than I expected to spend to get to what was a, uh, a fully uh, developed end state of a lot of those initiatives, and we've been slower to uh, get rid of the uh, consulting cost uh, than uh, than uh, I had hoped we would be. Uh, we're taking another hard run at that in uh, 2020. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that we will be much more successful in uh, reducing uh, consulting cost uh, in uh, 2020 than uh, we were in 2019. Um, that could help, uh, help us uh, uh, tame some of that expense growth. Uh, we also, because uh, you know, I visited every office in the company last year and, and didn't do that solo, did that with a pretty sizable entourage of uh, community banking people that uh, went with me to really get a, a much better grassroots view of what's going on in every market in the company and so forth. Uh, you know, we're trying to really mitigate travel expenses this year. We not only did I go to those markets, but then after I went and identified specific issues in the markets and so forth, uh, we uh, we had a lot of other people go back to work on improving, enhancing whether it was technology, process, procedures, training, whatever. Uh, work on various things that we identified we could improve. So. Uh, we hope to get some of those costs down, but at the same time, we also realize we've got to uh, continue to grow our pool of talented people, and uh, that includes people who can originate and produce new business. So um, we're, we, are, uh, uh, we are spending a little more money than I expected to spend or hope to spend, but, um, you know, sometimes things cost more to get uh, to the end state than you originally expected. So we, we've continued to uh, experience a little bit of that. We are trying to cut out unproductive and inefficient expenditures and get more efficient in, for example, doing things with our internal team, which we can do less expensively than we can with the consultants. So we're, we're working on it. Okay, that's great commentary. Thanks for that. And in, in switching gears uh, on the deposit side, we, we've seen a pretty big shift uh, of deposit mix over the last two quarters. I think CDs now represent around 40% of overall deposits, and it's trending higher. Should we expect an additional shift from here? And, and if so, what, what's driving that big shift of deposits? Yeah, I think you're saying a couple of things there. Uh, number one is, uh, you know, when rates were very low, uh, a lot of people parked money in money market accounts and savings accounts because 
there was not much yield difference between money market and savings and CDs. And, uh, you know, you've seen a, a steady migration that continues even now uh, as rates went up and CD rates got higher, people began to be a little more uh, judicious about how they manage that money. And we've seen a lot of that trend and we're seeing that trend continue. And then uh, secondly, we had some wholesale sources of deposits that were in money market accounts or, or other uh, non-CD accounts. We are making a concerted effort to improve the quality of our deposit base, and this is part and part of our, our uh, tour of all the branches and, and uh, so forth. So in a lot of our rural markets, uh, you know, one of the keys to attracting uh, new deposits and new relationships and building core customers is uh, driven from the CD side of the business. So we're replacing, in a lot of cases, uh, wholesale non-CD deposits that were chunkier and, and probably more volatile with uh, local market CD deposits that are much uh, much uh, smaller, more granular, and uh, uh, much less volatile and have the uh, additional benefit of giving us cross-sell opportunities for core account relationships and so forth. So this is a uh, conscious decision and while the, uh, you know, you would, you would normally look at it and say the mix, from, the shift in mix from non-CD to CD is, is an adverse shift, we actually view that as a positive shift when you when you get down and you really drill into the part of it that is due to wholesale non-CD funding sources being reduced in deference or preference for uh, retail CD uh, funding sources. So there's a bigger strategy at work here. We think that uh, strategy will be very beneficial to us longer term. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Brock Vanderfleet with UBS. Your line is now open. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, it, the uh, the problem, uh, the, the downgraded credit, this is the uh, the Tahoe credit that we've talked about in the past, yes? Uh, it's, yes, near Tahoe. It's in uh, near Truckee. Got it. Uh, at, at this point, our... Are all the proceeds from from lot and home sales um, are those going directly to repay the repay the loan or pay the interest on the loan or is only a portion of that? Uh, Brock, there there's a revolver in the facility for home construction and a revolver in the facility for lot development. So the uh, the proceeds. Uh, basically come in, pay the loan down, and then, you know, uh, they're building new townhomes, developing new lots uh, from that. So these are revolving, uh, principally revolving facilities that uh, the money does come in and pay it down, but it gets redeployed to build the next phase of, uh, of the project or the next units in the project. Has there been discussion of just – you know, just locking down uh, the the principles in terms of hey guys um, let's let's not uh, pursue the next phase let's you know wrap it up and uh, you know take our lumps and move on. Um, I, I think the uh, much more prudent approach is to uh, these guys have uh, you know decent to uh, good uh, sales velocity and, and pricing momentum, I think the much more prudent course, uh, Brock, is to, uh, as long as they're having good success doing it, let them continue to uh, uh, develop this thing out. You know, this is a very nice project, and uh, it's a very viable project. The, the simple reality is this project started uh, right before the Great uh, Recession. It got severely revalued as a result of the Great Recession and, and never uh, has, you know, never gotten a, a much higher valuation, uh, somewhat higher, but not, not fully recovered 
what were the original expectations on it, and as a result, you just got too much debt. So you you have an over leveraged project, as is clearly evident from the loan to value on it, and and uh, it's a excellent real estate asset that is being well received by consumers, and uh, uh, townhomes are selling. Lots are selling. Homes are being built on many of the lots that are selling. So it's you know it's a a very viable project. Uh, it just has too much debt in it, and we think the way to uh, maximize uh, uh, our uh, credit and uh, hopefully avoid any loss in the credit is to continue to uh, let these guys execute the business plan and uh, uh, get this thing. Uh, work through. Now, there will reach a point uh, in a couple of years where, you know, the there will be no more lots to develop, there will be no more or fewer townhomes to build, and the uh, uh, loan will begin to amortize uh, as a result of that, and, and the revolvers will go down because you're not replacing existing product with new product. So uh, it's, it's a... Uh, it's a working project. How uh, how far away are we from that point where it's just paying down? Would you say uh, a couple of years into the future? And I don't know the exact date, Brock, but you know it's it's going to be here for a while. Got it. Okay. Thanks, George. Our next question comes from Jennifer Dembo with SunTrust. Your line is now open. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Question about um, deposits. You brought in a chief deposit officer about a year ago. You talked a little bit about a few minutes ago about um, CDs and getting some more C um, retail CDs versus wholesale. What other strategies have been implemented or or do you plan to implement in terms of, um, of gathering or improving the funding mix? Uh, you know, an excellent, uh, e excellent question. Uh, we're approaching that from all sorts of uh, uh, different uh, uh, directions, and and I think making some progress. But um, you know, we're we're clearly uh, looking at our our deposit product set, and uh, we are in the process of. Uh, uh, redesigning all of that deposit product set, and uh, we will roll those products out probably uh, in the second quarter of this year. There's a possibility we may roll those out, some of them late first quarter, but I think more likely it's a second quarter 2020 rollout. At that point, the uh, uh, most of the existing uh, deposit products will become back book products, um, and we'll be selling a totally new product set. We think that is going to uh, include a number of features that uh, will will be very uh, much desired and appreciated by our customers. That will, uh, you know, have us in a situation where we're selling our products based on the uh, the quality and convenience and the uh, philosophy of those products, as opposed to. Uh, uh, solely on price, so we think that helps us both in customer acquisition and and uh, cost of funds. Um, we are also working to make sure that uh, um, our commercial products are uh, uh, much more desirable, and uh, we're a much more effective competitor for that. We will be rolling out tentatively scheduled for April a major revamp of our commercial products and how our customers interact with, I'm sorry, August. I said April, August. The other A9. Uh, um, and um, that um, is a very technology-based um, uh, evolution of our commercial uh, products. We think that will again be be very well received we're working on an evolution of our technology for how our customers interact with us on wire transfers that we will roll out in early 2021 we are uh, working on uh, 
a, uh, and have implemented really a total redesign of our retail banking staff as a result of having visited every office in the company. Uh, our chief banking officer and, and chief uh, retail uh, banking officer uh, have uh, redesigned the job descriptions and job titles of every uh, employee in the company. You know, we we made 15 acquisitions. We slotted people from those acquisitions into uh, job descriptions that uh, fit in our former legacy bank OZK world, but didn't necessarily match up with the uh, cultures and uh, staffing of some of the uh, uh, banks we acquired. And as we visited every office, uh, Cindy Wolf and Carmen McLennan, Cindy's our chief banking officer, and Carmen's our head of retail banking, chief retail banking officer, and uh, Alan Jessup, uh, who is our uh, head of community banking on the lending side and all of our specialty lending verticals in community banking, realized that we really had a lot of people somewhat miscast and we're not maximizing the potential. So after going through every branch and visiting every branch and really understanding at a very detailed level what's going on in the branches, uh, the uh, four of us and several other people went through every single employee in the company and uh, talked about those employees with their supervisors, managers, and, and their managers, managers, and supervisors and uh, reassigned job descriptions and uh, uh, titles for every person on the retail side of the company that uh, uh, we think will allow us to uh, maximize the individual potential to contribute to our, our success and our customers uh, in the company. Uh, we also revamped our, in the process of revamping our call center and digital services, uh, we've revamped over the last year marketing, and we've revamped what used to be training, which is now organizational learning and development, all with the goal of helping us be a much more potent force in retail banking and, and deposit gathering. So we're, we're taking a very broad and holistic approach to this as well as digging down into the details at, at every point of attack. So I'm, I'm very excited about where I believe our company is going to go and evolve to as being a highly competitive retail bank. Uh, we've also uh, taken all of our online apps. We uh, went through a, a very significant conversion, uh, which required us to write a lot of uh, uh, code to do it and, and got all of those consolidated into a single app that allows us the functionality and flexibility to add various features along the way without having to burden our customers with having, you know, five apps on their mobile device or seven apps on their mobile device. It, it, it all integrates through one single app and, uh, you can move very fluidly and very quickly from one function to the other. This was a huge undertaking and uh, puts us in a good foundational position to really begin to roll out a much more effective and desirable mobile banking platform uh, going forward. So it, it, we've been working on a lot of things and, and we spent a lot of money on these things, but uh, I'm convinced there's a great payback that will ultimately come from this work. Thanks, George. Thank you. Our next question comes from Brian Martin with Janie Montgomery Scott. Your line is now open. Hey, good afternoon. Hey, good afternoon, Brian. Hey, just one question, George. Just I appreciate all the color on the infrastructure bill. Just kind of thinking about, you know, kind of the efficiency and th how trends play out. It sounds as though the expenses the expense growth rate could moderate some in 2021. So I guess the way to think about it is the efficiency should trend a bit higher as you continue to do, continue to execute on what you've outlined and then maybe moderate, you know, some uh, back in 2021. Is that kind of fair how to think about it or how much impact the efficiency could have 
uh, this year with the with the change in kind of the uh, build out? Uh, Brian, I think given the fact that we we've got very uh, conservative growth uh, expectations for 2020, given the uh, payoffs that we've already talked about and the competitive environment, I, I think you're probably thinking about that correctly. That the uh, the trend in the efficiency ratio in 2020 is probably up, not down. Uh, if we can uh, begin to moderate that rate of expense growth in 2021 and we can get uh, more uh, uh, in line with our historical growth rates in 2021 and 2022, then I think we begin to, begin to see that efficiency ratio uh, get better. So you're exactly right. Okay. And then just one back to the uh, the loan yields. I think you talked about the community banking and the indirect, but just on the RESG, are you seeing uh, yields there on new production kind of stabilize? Are you still feeling pressure to kind of give a little bit on, on the rate there for the right credit, you know, that uh, you're looking at? Well, I think you always, in, in any environment, you uh, find yourself that for a particular credit and particular relationship, you give a little bit on, on pricing. You know, uh, one of the challenges that we've had in RESG is uh, in in 20. 16 and 2017, we were in a much less competitive environment for construction and development loan origination, so we got wider margins, and we talked about that in, in that period of time that, you know, a lot of banks had pulled back from the space, and we were getting wider margins, and then as the banks came back into the space, those margins uh, got back toward more normal margins, and with the... Uh, Trump uh, tax cuts, you know, we tried to hold the margins, but a lot of banks just began and, and debt funds and others began to uh, sort of bleed those margins lower, taking advantage of the lower tax rates to get more competitive on the uh, on the loan side. Um, I, you know, I don't think our, our margins uh, versus LIBOR or, you know, prime rate, I don't think we've seen much... Uh, degradation in our margins over the last year versus that, but clearly the margins that we were working with in 19 were less than the margins we were achieving in 16 and 17. So as those older loans have rolled off and the newer loans have rolled on, uh, we, we've uh, probably been replacing those at a lower margin. Um, but but I don't think that's particularly changed over the course of 19. I think it's more of a 19 versus 16 and 17 phenomenon than it is a Q1 of 19 versus Q4 of 19. Okay, that's helpful. And just last thing for me is just going back to that figure eight, when you talked about the outsized payoffs this year, I, I guess it seems like the message is if that two to three year, two to four year window on these loans uh, funding up, I guess is that suggests that 2021 could could see a healthy decline in the payoffs given that normal cycle. You know, is that is that the right way to think about it? I, I think that's the most uh, logical interpretation of, of the data. You know, uh, 2018 was 4.74 billion right. in originations. That you know, it is going to be a 2020, mostly 2021, lesser extent 2022 set of payoffs. And, uh, you know, that that compares to the uh, 2017 $9.1 billion. So, you know, when, you, when we originated the uh, uh, 2016 and 2017 large numbers, we knew they were going to pay off at some point in time, and the, the hope was we'd be able to continue to find, you know, an ever-growing world of opportunities and, and keep out running that payoff wave. And obviously when uh, uh, construction and development activity slowed down and competition got very aggressive in 18 and we uh, originated less volume, you know, uh, we we began to understand as time has gone on that that uh, the differential in originations payoff ways was going to create what happened to us in in 19 and and will probably happen in 20 and that's we'll have some pretty slow growth uh, years till we get through that so 
I, I do think you're right that uh, we ought to have less payoff headwinds in, in uh, 21 and 22 than we've had in 19 and 20. Gotcha. Okay. I appreciate all the color. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Stephen Scouten with Piper Sandler. Your line is now open. I'm sorry. I didn't have any further questions. Apologies. All right. Thank you. With that, I'm showing no further questions in queue. I'd like to turn the call back to Mr. Gleason for closing remarks. All right. Well, thank you all very much for joining the call today. We greatly appreciate uh, your time and attention. We look forward to talking with you again in about 90 days. Have a great uh, first quarter. Thank you. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.